Morning, guys and girls. Today, I wanted to talk to you guys about the different types of crystals that we get. So a quick recap of what we talked about yesterday are what are the things that all solids, whether they be amorphous or crystalline, uh, possess the ability to do or not do. So the first thing we said was, what's the difference between these two? And it's all about the organization of the particles. Right? Crystalline solids have a very distinct, repeated, orderly pattern that occurs over and over again. And amorphous solids, the particles are arranged more randomly, both in geometric shape and in order of particles. And that led to certain differences between them, right? Amorphous solids don't have one melting temp. They have a range of melting temps, right? They're called isotropic. Crystallines are called anisotropic. But whether you're amorphous or you're crystalline, you possess certain characteristics that is similar between all solids. First of which we said was definite shape and volume. No matter which type you are, your shape remains fixed, your volume remains fixed. And we said it's because the IMFs are so strong that the particles can't move. Therefore, the shape is stuck and the amount of space they take up are stuck. Then we transitioned into right, the temperatures that they melt at. We said crystals have a very distinct melting temp. Reason being that their IFs are the same throughout the entire crystal because the pattern is the same throughout the entire crystal. Whereas the amorphous, they have a range of temps because at some points during the crystal, they have weaker IFs and other points they have stronger IFs. So part of it starts melting at one temperature and the stronger stuff starts melting at a different temperature. Uh, we said that all solids are highly dense and incompressible because there's no space between the particles. Uh, it again, linked to the strength of the IFs. Also, staying on the theme of the strength of intermolecular forces, we said that the solids can't diffuse. They don't mix with each other very well because the blue particles are so strongly bonded together, whether it be through ionic or metallic bonds or the covalent IFs like hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole, or London dispersion, that they can't break away and infiltrate the next door neighbor in the red or the aqua-colored green that you see there which lets us start to get into, well, what types of crystals can we get? And how do we draw those different types of crystals? We can draw pictures for covalent structures. How do we do it for these other types? Well, the first thing I want you to know is that when we're talking about these types of solids, we're talking about crystals and all crystals have a structure to them. And that structure is known as a crystal lattice. So what you're seeing here are two different styles of presenting a crystal lattice. The one on the left here is referred to as the ball and stick model, where the spheres, the greens and the reds that you're seeing, uh, are representing the atoms that are participating in the bond. And the white sticks that you see represent the bonds, whatever the type that they may be holding those together. That doesn't particularly reflect reality because we tend to make them all be the same size, right? And we know from all the things that we've done that ions in particular will come in varying shapes and sizes uh, because of how many energy levels that they may have. The one here on the right takes the size considerations into effect and it shows molecules more like how they are with their electron clouds. This is referred to as a space filling model. This one is showing that the red molecules, right, or the red ions are substantially smaller. They must have less energy levels coming from higher up on the periodic table, and the green spheres must be lower down on the periodic table, right, and that's why you're seeing these larger spheres. So you'll see crystal lattices presented in both fashions, right, and that is the simplest unit of the cell repeated over and over again. Uh, and that simplest unit gets a name as well. They call that a unit cell. So the crystal lattice is the entire structure that we're looking at. 
right? But if we boil that structure down right, to the simplest repeatable pattern, in this example, it's a cube, that's known as the unit cell. So the unit cell is the simplest piece and the crystal lattice is what happens when you stack those all on top of each other. Imagine it to be like a stack of pennies, right? The giant stack of pennies that you're looking at, whatever we make them be, right, is the crystal lattice and an individual penny is known as the unit cell. And these are both ways to describe what's going on with our crystalline solids. So what types of solids do we get? Well, fundamentally, we consider there to be four different types. All right, the first one that you see here is an ionic crystal. And what you're going to find is that the crystals tend to reflect the bond type that holds those substances together. So an ionic bond, if you remember, is made up of positive and negative ions held together through electrostatic attraction, opposite charge attraction. These are made up of metals and non-metals, one from the left and one from the right of the periodic table. So if we take our favorite ionic substance, sodium chloride table salt, right, you will see that table salt will arrange itself in a repeated pattern over and over again. And it's the identity of these spheres that determine the type of crystal right? because the cl negative is an anion and because the na plus is a cation and we have an ionic bond connecting these this is an ionic crystal and these come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes which we'll talk about later on right, but for now we're just learning what the types are right here's a real world depiction and one of the cool things that you will find out about these crystals is that whatever shape the unit cell is in this, it's looking like it's cubic. If we compound it over and over again, what you'll see is that the real world sample will reflect that structure. That's why we're seeing all these cubes in the sodium chloride sample here. And that's what this one was uh, looked like when it was mined. That's why there's that pinkish tint to it. So what types of characteristics do ionic crystals have? Right? They have general properties of being hard. The ionic bond is very strong, which makes it hard to separate these pieces. So they're hard. That makes them brittle though, right? which means if we do hit them hard enough to break them, we can't shape them like a metal, right? We will shatter it like a piece of glass would, right? It would break into very tiny uh, pieces at definitive fault lines, like where the weakest connections are. Because the ionic bond is strong, it takes a lot of temperature to overcome this connection to separate them. So they have high melting points. And because there's not a lot of mobility in these ions, they're locked in place as a solid. They're very bad conductors of heat and electricity. To conduct well, ions need to be able to move. The molecules need to be able to move. And they can't do this when they're in the solid structure. If you dissolve it in water, it's a different story. Right? But while it's a solid, they are bad conductors of heat and electricity. And if they don't conduct those things well, we look at the positive, it means they're good insulators. Uh, we could use that to keep us away from electricity. We could use it to keep us away from heat because it won't pass through the substance. So your first type of crystal, ionic crystal. All right, second type is one of the cooler ones. All right, uh, It's called a network solid or a covalent network solid. Right? And a covalent network, just as it says, is made up of covalent bonds. And this can happen in two different ways. So there's two different types of covalent crystals. That's why there's four crystals and not just the three bond types we learned. So covalent networks right, are what you see here. And this three-dimensional covalent network that you're spinning right, is the uh, common form that you see of diamond. Right? And the properties of these covalent networks reflect their structure. If you look at this guy, even though the covalent bond is weaker than the ionic, this has many, many more connections. It's connected left and right. It's connected up and down. There's three-dimensional connections. All right, so these have connections in a lot of different directions. And because each one is so connected to its next door neighbor, it makes them very, very strong. 
And covalent networks come in two types. They can be two-dimensional. They can be three-dimensional. We keep it simple in Gen Chem if you want to learn all about that. Take AP next year. All right. But in general terms, all right, covalent network solids have atoms that are covalently bonded in two-dimensional or three-dimensional networks. They have really high melting points because there's so many connections. They're very, very hard, which makes them great insulators because the lack of motion means we can't conduct things well. Right? Some examples that you've heard of, right? diamond is one, graphite is one. That's a great distinction between a two-dimensional and a three-dimensional. Why are those both made of carbon but have such distinctly different characteristics? Well, the diamond's a three-dimensional covalent network and graphite's a two-dimensional. So we can separate the graphite into layers, which is why they make pencils out of it, and it makes it relatively soft to separate those layers. These guys are made just like covalent bonds are made, non-metals, non-metals, two from the same side of the periodic table. Could be two of the same element, or it could be two different non-elements, leading you to things like silicon dioxide or silicon carbide. Just some examples of your covalent network solids. And then, like I said, their properties are a reflection of their structure. The more complex they are, the stronger the network tends to get. So second type, covalent networks. Third type, getting back to another bond type that we learned, right, are metallic crystals. And I know it's tough to think of a metal as a crystal, right? but it is. It's just the solid form of these things that you experience is copper and gold and zinc and all the things that live in the middle of the periodic table and to the left of the staircase. So just like we could form right, metallic bonds with just one element, or we could form alloys with multiple elements, right? we could do the same with our metallic crystals. The only unifying characteristic is that all the spheres that are next to each other are positive cations. Notice it's not alternating positives and negatives like the ionic crystal does. We've got positive, 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 which would make you think that these would all wanna repel and burst the crystal into a million pieces. But don't forget what holds metallic bonds together like we talked about is the sea of electrons. Each one of these cations have given their valence electrons into this area that's communal between all of them. So we have a very pulsing negative electron feel between all of these different positive cations. So just like the metallic bond, we get the metallic crystal. Over here on the right, here's one that you would see three-dimensionally that they would mine out of a uh, cave or some other cold, dark place. And your general characteristics or your general characteristics of a metallic bond. They're great conductors of heat and electricity because all of these electrons are mobile. They can move. So when heat gets into the sea of electrons, it is able to move through it. When electricity gets in here, it is able to move through it. Things are not locked in place. The cations are, but the electrons are not. Uh, because we can form so many different metals at these positive sites, the other properties tend to vary. Things like um, the hardness and the melting points depend on how big the charge on this cation is. If it's a plus one charge, like one of your group one metals, those tend to be pretty weak connections. They're soft, right? They tend to uh, break relatively easily things like that. But if it's a plus four, plus five charge, plus three charge for this cation, it's a much stronger metal. Some can take plus seven charges or oxidation states is what they're technically called. And those will be very strong metals like molybdenum and things like that. Uh, so there's a cool demo that goes with this that I wanted to show you, but since we aren't together, I'm just going to show you a video of it. And it's a good way to refresh ourselves on alloys. And what I do is I take a copper penny, and I turn it into gold. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play that for you right now so that you guys can see what that demo would have looked like.
So kind of a cool demo uh, reminding you how alloys work. And there's some chemistry in there you guys haven't learned yet when he's talking about oxidation reduction. Apologies there. And what happened was he took the zinc ions out of solution and plated zinc metal on top of the copper. And that's where the silver came from. And then what happened was once that silver color was there, which is really zinc, he heats it up with the hot plate and that creates just enough space in between your positive cations that what happens is, is the zinc starts to infiltrate the copper and we get that distinctive yellowish color, which makes it look like gold, but it's really brass, which is a mixture of copper and zinc. So kind of a cool demo, just a nice way to remind ourselves about metallic bonds, alloys, and no matter which it is, just a regular old-fashioned metallic bond where it was all the zinc, or we convert it into the brass, right, where it's the zinc with the copper, where it's an alloy, they are all considered metallic crystals because it's metallic bonds that hold them together. So there's your third type of crystal. We've got ionic, we've got covalent networks, We've got metallic. The last one is the second type of covalent crystal. And the second one there is called a covalent molecular crystal, right? And these ones are almost the exact opposite of your covalent network. So your covalent moleculars do not have bonds in between them like the networks do. What they have are one molecule being attracted with intermolecular forces to another molecule. And remember, intermolecular forces on the grand scale are weak. Even a hydrogen bond, which is the strongest of them, is weak compared to an ionic or a metallic bond by far. So these things do not do the same things that most of our other solids tend to do. They have many, many, many characteristics that are opposite of the ones we've talked about. For instance, they are soft, they have low melting points, and they're poor conductors of heat and electricity, the exact opposite of some of the things we were talking about. All of our others tend to be hard because we had strong connections between them. They had high melting points because the connections were strong. Uh, but the similarity is, is they are not good conductors because there's not a lot of mobility once these get in here. And some good examples you see are water and ammonia. Uh, these are covalent compounds, but we're talking about the inner molecular forces that hold those things together, which is why ice can melt at room temperature and gold does not and salt does not and things of that nature. All right, so the only other thing I wanted to show you today is uh, a chemistry crash course, which I use few and far between. Right, but there's a kind of cool one that goes with uh, talking about solids. So if you ever get the chance, these are good to review. I'm going to let that guy play, and then we'll wrap things up.
So that's a pretty cool uh, recap that goes very fast. I know those are fun to watch, but I can't imagine ever teaching you off one of those because he just downloaded almost a week's worth of information to you in nine minutes. Uh, moral of the story is uh, hopefully you guys have a good understanding of your types of solids. Uh, still to come will be shapes of solids. That's probably what we'll get into tomorrow and uh, phase changes. Uh, don't forget to do page 371, numbers one through four, which were attached uh, to the PowerPoint. Uh, I'm sorry, attached to the parent square message uh, that uh, should have came your way this morning. Uh, other than that, I hope everybody's doing well. And I will talk to you guys soon. As usual, uh, I'll be around uh, at one o'clock in the Google Meet room uh, for anybody that's having questions on any of the homework problems or struggling with uh, connections to getting any materials that they need. Hope everybody's doing well. See ya.